Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. My name is Dominic Daroli and I'm responsible for Smart Cities at Esri. With me today is Nathan Tveris, the set supervisor Hello. at Pixar Animation Studios. Nathan, glad to have you on the webinar and welcome. Now, oh, thank you, I'm glad to be here. Now, before we start, I want to take a moment and congratulate Nathan and the whole team at Pixar for this massive success with Incredibles 2. It was grossing over $1.2 billion and was the most successful Pixar movie of all time at the box offices worldwide. So congrats for this amazing success. Now, I, will, I would also like to say thank you to the people who made this webinar possible. And that is Nancy and Eric from the Visual Effects Society, as well as Michael, Emily, and the whole team at Pixar Animation Studios. Thank you very much for all your support. That is much appreciated. Now, what is on today's agenda? First, we have a short intro and housekeeping remarks. Then Nathan will elaborate on the cities of Incredibles 2. And then at the end, we have the summary and we should have some time for feedback and Q&A. Hope that works for you. And before we start, we have just three housekeeping items to cover. First, if you have a question, please feel free to use the question window, type in your questions and then click send. Second, for your convenience, we set up a box folder with all the content and links from today's webinar. You can access this box folder at bit.ly slash veswebinar2019. This URL is case sensitive, so please write it quickly down or make a picture screenshot right now. Okay, and we will repeat that URL one more time at the end of the webinar. And last but not least, uh, next week will be SIGGRAPH. And we will have a booth at SIGGRAPH uh, next week in LA. So if you want to meet City Engine Mastermind, Pascal Mueller, and myself for a personal meeting, please use the link bit.ly slash SIGGRAPH2019. And please note that again, this URL is case sensitive and it's also in the box folder that I just uh, mentioned. But now let's get started with Nathan and building the cities of Incredibles 2. And I just make you right now presenter, Nathan. And oh. the floor is yours and I'll let you know once we see your screen. All righty. That yes. looks like it, right? Yes, that looks perfect. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us. I appreciate you all uh, taking uh, some of your time to uh, learn a little bit about the uh, city efforts we, uh, we did on this film. So uh, what are we talking about? We're going to look at some of the inspiration, planning process that went into building the cities on Incredibles 2 um, from kind of early... Um, you know, uh, story requirements to previs execution integration into Pixar's pipeline. We're going to touch on various aspects of the city building process, both creative and technical. So let's uh, start with the story requirements on uh, Incredibles 2. So really early on, um, early versions of the film, there was when I was trying to figure out the best approach to city building on the project, uh, there was the possibility of needing a lot of cities. There was this concept of this worldwide corporation that had headquarters uh, all over the place. That's in the finale of the film. Those headquarters would pull themselves up and be these these giant robots um, that would all kind of walk across the planet to get to each other. And you know, by extension. That meant that each one of these would need to be surrounded by a city, and they would each city would need to look different so that we could tell that they were in different places around the world. Um, fortunately, um, after a little bit, that part of the story was cut. I mean, fortunately, I mean it would have been awesome, but uh, uh, fortunately for me, who had to make all the cities, um, it got narrowed down to a, a little bit of a simpler city requirement. Uh, what we ended up needing was two cities. We needed Municiburg, which was the kind of a, our version of the city from the first film, and a new city called New Urbum. Um, although we did need to see these cities from a lot of different viewing angles, from the air, from the ground, from out to sea, like lots of different places. Um, so we needed to kind of uh, approach those in different ways technically. 
what we ended up doing was we had kind of a set extension version of the city, and we also had kind of our, our hero city uh, streets, which we'll, we'll touch on a bit later. Um, before we jump, jump into that, though, let's talk a little bit about what what makes a city? Um, what, what does a city look like? We can, we can all recognize one, but what visual aspects are the most important? It turns out those aspects can be very different uh, depending on how you're looking at that city. As an example, here's Kansas City, uh, Missouri. I went to college here. Um, it's a metropolitan area, has a little over 2 million people. It's kind of a medium-sized Midwestern city. You look at this, you see city skyline, you see a few unique landmarks, and it, it says city. Here's a, a kind of a classic city skyline, Cincinnati, Ohio, another kind of medium-sized uh, Midwestern American city. Um, in this image from where we're looking at it, it's about the skyline shape. It's about uh, man-made landmarks like the bridges and uh, the stadium that is there, um, that sort of thing. But when you look at that from the air, it suddenly becomes a different deal. Like this, the, the skyline kind of disappears. Uh, it's no longer silhouetted, silhouetted against the sky. Um, it becomes much more about large scale infrastructure like the, uh, the freeways and the bridges and the kind of natural land, landscape like the big river, uh, large scale cities changes like um, big neighborhoods, green spaces, things like that. And on the flip side, looking at the city from um, like a, a tall building within that skyline, suddenly uh, it's more about the things that you're looking down on. It's about roof items, it's about uh, parked cars, it's about nearby buildings, um, and it's much less about the city as a whole, and you start to getting into a, a smaller piece of the city. Similarly, down on the ground, in this, this case, this is uh, streets of Chicago, all those things we just talked about are pretty much invisible. Um, it becomes much more about human scale objects. It's about those lampposts, it's about uh, planters and signs and public transit and things that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, here's Boulder, Colorado, same deal. It becomes about the vegetation, it's about the benches and storefronts and signage and none of that, none of the stuff that we were talking about uh, from the sky is visible. Uh, so what this means is that we have to really approach these things in two different ways. A single approach will not work. If we use the left as reference to build our entire city, we'd have these super dense, really heavy uh, assets that would be um, like unusable in the wide shots. And if we used only the right as reference, when we got down on the ground, it would be very sparse because we wouldn't have all those little things. So we settled on uh, two methods. Uh, we have kind of our standard pipeline sets, which are hand-built in Maya, and we have our uh, set extensions, which we use City Engine and Houdini to build. So let's talk a little bit about the concept, uh, kind of high level stuff, like what are we making here? Um, we're making mid-century America. This is the late 1950s, early 1960s. This particular picture is Chicago. Uh, here's a few other uh, kind of reference images where it's you know big wide streets, uh, medium to tall buildings, lots and lots of uh, big American cars, that sort of thing, kind of your classic Americana stuff. Uh, we had some really early maps that kind of gave a general overview of the city structure and locating uh, the old uh, par house, which was destroyed at the uh, end of the first film, and their, their new house in, uh, in the second film. Uh, this also kind of took some parts of real maps and combined them, pieced together a structure that worked for some action sequences and chasing, things like that. Uh, our production designer, Ralph Eggleston, really likes to map out uh, plot points so that things can make uh, some logical sense. Uh, on left is a very early version, uh, which as you can see labeled lots of things that are not in the film uh, that were cut like a, a fashion show that Edna was doing. There was an incredible chase, which actually, as we'll talk about in a moment, a lot of our city is structured around that was, uh, that was cut, things like that. Um, so what that did was give us enough information to kind of jump into the previous effort. So um, based on those maps, we kind of created some elevation, uh, land and water maps for uh, roughly 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer square of the city. Uh, this is where we use City Engine for our, our previous work. Um, we kind of started with that terrain, used, you know, built using those maps, made ourselves that uh, square of land, and uh, started building our city. Um, and while those that are aware, you know, the city engine can do lots of pretty amazing stuff with regards to ingesting uh, like map and zoning data of real cities and, and doing all kinds of stuff that's based on real world things. What we really wanted though was not that. We wanted to be able to hand draw in some of our main roads, such as our like say freeways and things like that, uh, and then build around those. Our, in our case, we had a story point, story point that we needed a, a pretty clear cut path from downtown uh, to the outskirts of the city. So that's kind of really what we started with was this big freeway uh, that went from downtown all the way out into the, uh, the burbs where they, uh, they were living. And we kind of uh, built from there. Um, 
what we wanted to do was generate areas of the city that were meant to be distinct neighborhoods. Uh, the goal being to mirror the way that many uh, medium-sized American Midwestern cities developed, uh, meaning that we had kind of an old town area, which would might have been the original port at the mouth of the river uh, with kind of a more organic pre-automobile street layout, um, a largely grid-based area where the city expanded, and then uh, a few changes in the layout just to make the city more interesting and broken up to look at from the air, and then finally some more sprawling roads to imply uh, sparse neighborhoods in rural areas on the outskirts. The nice thing was that um, so much of the street layout was procedural, so we could easily tweak it all until we ended up with the general layout that we were happy with, uh, which is kind of what you see here. Um, the next step was to come up with a rule set that would generate uh, buildings in a way that would uh, kind of represent our city and its neighborhoods. Uh, for those not familiar with City Engine, it uses a set of uh, rules to procedurally generate uh, both the lots and the buildings, um, which allows for generation of a huge number of buildings. Uh, in our case, I think this uh, our previs had roughly 78,000 buildings uh, at this stage. Um, what I did was start with uh, one of the example rule sets, and um, I don't know if anyone else played uh, SimCity, uh, but I tried to color code my buildings to just kind of match that. So I had like large, medium, and small uh, residential and commercial buildings, as, where, as well as an uh, area of high-rise buildings for the downtown area. And it also allowed for some manual overrides so I could designate specific uh, districts, like the red buildings on the left there, which were uh, to represent a, uh, a warehouse district. Uh, it also let us start figuring out where the Parr family home would be in relation to the center of the city uh, and determine kind of what their, their view might look like. After various, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after various revisions, uh, this is the uh, final previs version of Municipalburg. You can see a few big uh, holes in the city uh, here in a bit, um, as well as some uh, uniquely shaped buildings. Those were added later to either make space for other models or represent uh, other areas for story specific moments. Like on the left there, you can see City Hall and that big circle is where uh, Victor Cache, who is the rich guy that buys the Incredibile, that's where his house was, uh, was supposed to be located. Uh, so this early previs allowed um, the city to start to be considered in terms of those neighborhoods and districts, as well as um, having some final street layout, which allowed us to map action uh, for, for uh, production sequences uh, around the city. It also gave the art department a place to start with the design of the city. So let's talk a little bit about, about the design and some of the concept artwork. Um, obviously, we had a city in the first film, uh, which we uh, did not decide to replicate exactly, but we went with um, kind of, uh, wanted to have the same feel as, as the first film. And so we had, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've only talked about Municipalburg so far, but we have two cities in the film. We have uh, Municipalburg and we have New Urban. And so there were going to be some design differences between these two things, while the technology used to create them is, is um, pretty, pretty close. Um, the design should be drastically different. And on the uh, the left there, our Municipalburg, as we talked about, should be broad streets, uh, sh shorter buildings, uh, lots of space, uh, kind of a more open city as a whole, whereas New Urban is really meant to be a much taller, denser uh, kind of mixture of New York and Hong Kong and Tokyo and some of the big cities of the world. Uh, that's sort of very, very uh, bustling. So with the previs work settled, um, work began to um, kind of do some drawovers of frames from the first film to consider how we might like to change some things. So uh, just talk, go through some of the artwork here. And so this is still uh, Municipalburg artwork for kind of the downtown areas, uh, trying to show um, you know, how wide the streets might be, um, try to show how we might get some of the mid-century modern um, details into the buildings, uh, that sort of thing. And you can see here, uh, we're talking, you know, some work uh, dealing with the skyline and how tall the buildings might be in Municipalburg, that sort of thing. Also, it, we had discussed a lot about trying to get some um, kind of modularity into our models so that we could mix and match different buildings together, so that we get a little more, um, a little more bang for the buck as far as the assets that we're we're creating. Uh, similarly, here, like you can see, there, right in the 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 middle is like a base that we could. Uh, plop that down and then put other towers on top of it. So if we needed something that was um, different on the ground level, but the same at, at uh, up higher, we can switch things around uh, and vice versa. 
obviously we had lots of props to model um, designed and, and some we used reused from past films things like that um, just a little bit of artwork for the inner suburbs this is kind of the, their neighborhood in the first film and some of those buildings and houses that sort of thing uh, we have like some warehouse districts that we see in a few sequences of more industrial buildings uh, and these were used both in Munisburg and and New Irvine. Um, some more warehouse kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's lots of rooftops. So we have lots of stuff that uh, needs to go on those roofs, that sort of thing. Okay, so switching over to New Urban a little bit. Um, like Municiburg, it was also planned out in, to suit action in a number of sequences. We have uh, three big ones in this sequence. We have a sequence where uh, Helen is chasing a runaway train on the Elasticycle. Uh, we have an air rescue where um, she's kind of up on the rooftops. Uh, and onto a helicopter uh, trying to rescue an ambassador and we've got uh, what we call tracking screen slaver where she's kind of going in between the buildings and rooftops to try to find uh, screen slaver's lair and so we had to figure out how those things fit together in the city as well as um, especially for the runaway train how how uh, the different sections of the chase uh, need to be visually different um, so that chase sequence covers covers a pretty wide range of areas as the action rapidly moves from downtown to an industrial district to a more uh, rural area and then finally approaches another small town. So this is some of the kind of concept art to designate how those things should look different. And if a few of these areas ended up being cut out um, just for simplicity and uh, and to make the, make it play a little quicker, like you can, there's some some stuff that are like big drainage areas which we we cut entirely. Um, so also the high-rise buildings in New Urban needed to have a different look to them to help audiences tell the two cities apart. Uh, in addition to uh, mid-century designs, we also incorporated some older styles such as uh, Art Deco and Gothic and things like that. And overall, the city was shaded to be a bit darker and a bit uh, dirtier so that it felt like it was an older city with more, more heavy stone and things like that and less... Uh, less concrete and clean clean surfaces like Munisburg has. Also, the downtown area of New Urban is meant to be much uh, taller, uh, much more dense and kind of overbearing, a little more intimidating uh, as a whole. Here's a little bit of uh, some of the kind of inspiration artwork as well as um, kind of lighting concept and uh, a little bit of the concept uh, artwork on the lower right there. Um, once again, we have uh, industrial slash warehouse kind of areas, and this, uh, the models here were mostly shared with Munisburg for their, their warehouse area. So that gave us enough information to begin our asset construction. Obviously, we had to make a lot of buildings. I think we had approximately 360, including uh, some of the variations on those, um, most of which needed to have mid-century details and be able to work both up close uh, at street level and as part of a larger city skyline. Um, that's all pretty straightforward stuff. One of the little tricks that we had uh, to kind of facilitate our procedural city building later on was to add a simple polygon to the top of each building, which indicated the amount of roof space that could be used for uh, further props like uh, air conditioning units, uh, radio towers, um, you know, water towers, things like that. Both large and small buildings had these and they were all named the same so they could be easily found by, uh, by the systems uh, later on in the process. Um, as far as putting together our hero streets, we had these sort of modular street tiles that could be uh, kind of pieced together based on action needs. So we would work with the layout department, figure out how much kind of runway we needed for a big chase sequence, and then piece a bunch of these, these tiles together in various forms to kind of get a, a kind of basis for, uh, for that action. Uh, and each one of those that was had uh, built into it a number of kind of guides. So you can see these lines here were um, guides for traffic. And so we knew where traffic could go from each one of those lanes. Um, there's also some kind of red lines, if you can see them, uh, that designate kind of the edge of the, the curb so that the uh, crowds don't wander off into the street. Obviously, this is a, it's a family film. We don't want anyone to get hurt, that sort of thing. Um, we made a lot of props to put on the streets. We uh, Let's see, we made a lot of stuff to go on the roofs as well. Um, you can't have a mid-century film with a lot of big rolling American iron, so we made a lot of vehicles. And uh, just a couple things to note, um, we're on shading, uh, kind of uh, tips and tricks that we uh, we found very useful. 
we had what we call a global shader that did almost all of the masonry shading. Um, anything that had a kind of brick or block-like pattern could be handled by the shader. And you can see kind of the wide variety of looks that could be dialed into the shader, um, really with the goal being to get a lot of variety as a whole in, in a big wide uh, view without having to make more buildings or uh, in shade them one at a time. Um, also, because we weren't really sure how close we were getting to the rooms uh, in our buildings, that they might only just be there in a quick shot. We didn't want to dress out a ton of physical offices and apartments, so we had kind of a, what we call a fake room shader that we've used for uh, quite a few films that uses parallax mapping to draw a box behind a flat plane. Um, to create some of the visual density, we augmented that shader with uh, techniques that are fairly common in real-time applications to do ray marching to uh, simple primitive shapes. Um, here you can see in Maya, the, uh, one of the offices that then turns into something like this. Um, that's those shapes are provided as a parameter to the shader. And then we get something that looks kind of like a little um, office meeting room here. Uh, modelers could kind of go to town, make a whole bunch of different rooms, um, office apartment shapes, et cetera, from cubes without, uh, without needing too much additional guidance. And then as well as some large ones, you know, these are meant to look like restaurants or lobbies, things like that in some of our larger buildings. And then we end up with that in there and then layer that into a building and in a shot. And then all those background windows all have uh, things that look at least plausibly like rooms, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so with that covered, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we put together our standard uh, pipeline sets. Um, this stuff shouldn't be... Uh, too wild and crazy, um, but for our uh, close-up shots of cities, we, we put these all together by hand. Um, Pixar's pipeline is built around USD and referencing, meaning that our, our models are built into USD files, and those are then referenced back into Maya to uh, in order to assemble our sets. So um, because it's uh, this USD, if those are not familiar, there's a, a link on your screen there. Um, it's an open source format um, released by Pixar that can contain a wide variety of information. It can hold geometry, animation, shading, nearly any other arbitrary data. Um, in practice, what this means is when we model things, either in Maya or other 3D packages, everything goes into Maya, and then there's a build process that converts those models into the USD format. Um, that gives us those models. Um, it runs through a uh, kind of version control system. We reference them back into Maya, and uh, that's how we kind of assemble our, our worlds. Um, those references are live, so any updates to the source models will appear in the set. It's you know kind of generally referred to as a push system. So if someone um, makes a new version of, of your building and uh, publishes that, you get that in your, um, your set, uh, like it or not. OK, so a little bit about uh, kind of assembling one of the things here. You can see the. Uh, the little um, street tiles that we talked about. Um, that's what we start with. Uh, we then add in things like terraces to get uh, a little bit of variety at street level. These ads so we can put some steps in front of uh, buildings, that sort of thing. There's some planters and green areas to try to break up the big uh, solid concrete of the street tiles, that sort of thing. And then drop in the buildings. Uh, as you can see, this was a very wide street because this was um, the main the main street for our uh, tunneler underminer chase uh, sequence at the beginning of the film. Vegetation obviously goes in the planners. Um, then you get things like street lights in there as well. Uh, and I think then we've got lots of lots more props that should, there they are, lots of props. And this gives us the ability to kind of designate smaller areas like, uh, like the outdoor cafe on the left. And obviously lots of cars, all that good stuff. Uh, similarly, in Urbum, um, it's really the same process, but a slightly different arrangement in that uh, we still have the street tiles, but all the buildings are much closer to the street because it's meant to be a you know much narrower space, uh, that sort of thing. And in this case, we use um, kind of the elevated train tracks to uh, do a number of things. One, to make the, feel, the city feel a bit more imposing and a lot closer, but also to help the sense of speed since we're going down the street very quickly. We want lots of things to be zooming by the camera overhead and along the sides, that sort of thing. Also, because this was a chase sequence, um, we have some small items, but a lot fewer than we would usually have in a, in a, a up close set like this, because everything's basically uh, hidden in motion blur. So that's our, our kind of hero set uh, construction process. Uh, let's talk a bit about set extensions. Um, how does it differ? So I'm going to skim over some of the, the technical details in this because there's there's a lot and can really go in pretty far. Um, but if anybody has any questions later on, uh, feel free to, to type them into the little 
uh, webinar thingy there. Um, okay, so the set extension versions of our cities were an entirely different beast. Uh, they were procedurally built in Houdini using ingredients from our city engine previs, and while the distribution of buildings, trees, props, et cetera, was all procedural, all of those props were instances of the same objects that we used to build our, our hand-dressed hand uh, city streets. So we didn't really need to build optimized background versions. Instead, we relied heavily on that instancing and shop-based uh, pruning uh, and uh, culling of, of smaller objects uh, to keep memory overhead uh, low enough to render. Um, so let's get into how this all worked. Uh, so our city structure can be broken down into its three levels. Uh, there's models, uh, which we already talked about, and then there are neighborhood sets, and these are kind of areas, each one of these has uh, all the stuff and it has a similar characteristic, kind of a neighborhood, you know, buildings would be similar, that sort of deal. And this is kind of how we chopped our, our big city up into uh, various pieces. And then there's kind of a city master set, which uh, kind of can just contain the information to keep all of these uh, neighborhoods um, spatially related to one another. So our original map based off of the, the previs, was what we defined, used to define our neighborhoods. Uh, that was translated into a version that Houdini could use. And here you can see those areas labeled into uh, to what we, we ended up calling them. And this, I believe, actually shows a bit of an extension to the, the hills, uh, northeast and south uh, areas, I think actually made our city larger than 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. I think it stretched another another five to 10 in each direction just to, uh, to get some rolling hills and background for uh, big wide shots. So the streets, sidewalks, and non-subdivided lots were brought over from City Engine. Um, we generated new terrain using using those lots, which uh, was so that we could cut it up into those neighborhoods. Um, and then those lots were resubdivided and triangulated uh, to avoid seams, and areas were designated as um, either building lots or maybe park lots, uh, sidewalks, streets, things like that. Um, models were selected uh, for a given neighborhood. Um, a population file would determine um, which models were using the neighborhood, including buildings, vegetation, uh, street props, things like that. And those were in a JSON file per, per neighborhood that would uh, list all the models to be used, which then could be filtered and sorted in Houdini later on. Um, Houdini would collect information on those models, um, primarily bounding box information to use later on to fit those models into uh, appropriately sized lots. Here you can see the same you see the bounding boxes first, and here are the actual buildings that they are uh, corresponding to. Um, and in general, the city generation network would do a bunch of things. Um, it would bring in the per neighborhood terrain, uh, only keep the rectangle lots that are intended for buildings, um, specify parameters for the lots, such as padding between buildings, uh, random seed values, things like that. Uh, optionally, we could define location-specific information, like if we wanted a very small like commercial center somewhere to help break up a large um, kind of flat area of the city, you could you could kind of place a point there and, and it would um, help change the uh, the target heights for uh, buildings in that area. Um, figure out building facing directions using the streets, and then height information was determined um, based on a number of things, uh, proximity to city center, uh, reference spheres, or what you're seeing on the screen here, which was a kind of a curve that would help you determine um, how uh, like the profile of downtown would, would fall off. And so this is just an example of how uh, the curves correspond to um, target heights. So speaking of target heights, this is what we start with is something like this. Like all those little white squares are kind of the targets for each lot. Um, and then Houdini would sample the collection of buildings, which we defined earlier, try to find one that best fits into each lot or a collection of buildings that fits into a lot, and then instance the models into there. Um, here you can see these are the points that uh, are determined for the buildings and then how that corresponds to the buildings themselves. This is our, uh, our downtown neighborhood, that sort of thing. Uh, and so here's the final result of our Municipurg set extension. Um, as you can see, this is in displayed in uh, a card mode, so uh, we can actually tumble around it. But um, as you can see, it is a full city, and it is light enough to uh, to move around and have a look at uh, that sort of thing. Lots of trees, lots of um, buildings. I should probably, I wish I had uh, a statistic on number of trees, but it's a lot of them. Um, so what that really meant for us, though, is that in a shot like this, um, we could just drop our city out there. Once we had determined where the par household was, uh, we could drop our city out there in the background in the corresponding spot. And if we really wanted to, we could fly right out the window and over our neighborhoods and kind of explore the city uh, from the air, which we end up doing in the finale of the film. 
Um, as you can see, because of the way it's constructed, it's a little bit sparse out here in between the buildings, but it uh, ends up looking pretty good from far away. So let's talk a little bit about pipeline integration. Um, how does all this stuff fit into Pixar's production? needed to integrate not only with each other, but also with Pixar's production pipeline. Um, there were a few things that needed to happen to get the two city types to work well together and also not be so heavy that they could not be rendered. To bring the hero sets and set extensions together, we had what we called uh, kill cubes. Um, these allowed for spatial deactivation. Here you can see them on the screen there. Spatial deactivation of parts of the set, uh, set extension to make room for the hero sets. So we would kind of uh, move these cubes around, um, cut out a, a hole in the set extension, uh, turn off the piece of terrain that uh, goes under there because we would be replacing with our hero terrain and, uh, and then drop in our hero set. So in practice, like this shot from, from Runaway Train, uh, we could drop in this big chunk of New Urbum, uh, kill cube away the foreground elements and then replace them with our high detail set. Uh, this way, all the gaps between buildings would be filled by city uh, with minimal per shot effort. Um, speaking of New Urbum, it did need to be caricatured a bit. Um, here's our, our first pass uh, at uh, New Urbum and those that have seen the film know that this is not what it looks like in the film. Uh, this was our production designer's uh, paint over of what he was thinking uh, it should look like and then our final result here. Um, this was really just a, a shortcut since we didn't have time to go and model a whole bunch of taller buildings. Uh, the set extension artist that was working on this um, just kind of duplicated buildings and then stack them on top of each other and shrunk each one a little bit so that it wouldn't have coincident faces with the, the one below. And we ended up with a nice big tall city. Uh, also, uh, while we did have kind of a basic um, kind of monolithic city for New Urban, um, there were a lot of these sorts of things that were like floating the individual neighborhoods that we could, uh, it sort of allowed our set dressers to grab whatever they needed to fill in gaps in, uh, in the foreground sets and just drop that in there and, and uh, kind of in a quicker fashion since uh, New Urban was a, a less thoroughly developed city than uh, Municipal. Uh, speaking of integration, integration into um, our lighting pipeline, um, we kind of got uh, mesh lights from our fake room shader in, uh, in Katana so that we could have a, a reasonable simulation of light spilling out from our fake room so that it didn't look like it was just a lit up card uh, with no light coming out. So as you can see in the little circled thing, I think it does a pretty good job of making it look like there's glass there and not just a, uh, a fake uh, parallax shader. Um, we had a lot of these light bulbs integrated into our regular models. They're they all kind of referenced in there. Um, and what you're seeing on the lower right there is uh, embedded light constraint points. Um, and what this allowed for was on something like this building right here, we would put them on the ledges, uh, pointing upwards, that sort of thing as part of our, our modeling process. And then our lighting department could, uh, I mean, this was the case, but not only on buildings, but like billboards and radio towers. And I think our cars had them on there as well, but it meant that um, a script could be run in Katana. So that in a shot like this, where there are tons of buildings, probably hundreds, if not thousands of lights, um, that first pass of, of lighting placement would be automated. It would uh, just happen on its own and um, wouldn't be a horribly painful process for a lighting artist. So I mentioned pruning earlier. Um, this is sort of a process by which we uh, kind of get rid of all the stuff that isn't necessarily needed in a individual shot without having to do this all by hand, um, that sort of thing. So we have kind of a process that that uses something sort of like a uh, almost ambient occlusion based uh, sample testing uh, process so that uh, we can see what's contributing to the actual um, image on the screen. So what you're looking at here on the top is uh, the will be sequ the uh, shots from the film, and on the bottom is like a, a 360 degree render, and the red frame is is the the image uh, above. Uh, and you can see when I start at playing here uh, how much stuff is actually missing outside of the uh, camera frustum. Um, we have a uh, I would say like a, uh, this is run on, I think on fives maybe, it might be every frame, but if you look, you can see things turning on right before it comes on screen and turning off as it goes off of screen, uh, that sort of thing. But this kind of allowed us to keep uh, overall a, um, a much lighter per shot uh, rendering load than you might expect having all of this uh, dense city stuff in there. But uh, it seemed to generally work work fairly well. So with that said, um, I've got 
a uh, kind of a little two minute reel of uh, most of the city work in the film that uh, I can kind of show here. And then I think we've got, looks like we've got a decent amount of time for, for questions and stuff if anybody has them. So I'll go ahead and uh, play this. Hopefully it will play well over the internets. Um, so cross your fingers. That was great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Let me quickly uh, change the screen. So there we go. So thank you very much. Uh, it was so impressive. And uh, if you want to experience um, City Engine basically by yourself, then I can offer you a free 30 day city engine trial at esri.com slash city engine and esri.com slash visual effects you will find predefined bundles for artists projects and studios and yes we even have a student version for city engine but now enough from that let us start with the q and a and again if you have a questions please use the question window, type in your question, and then click send. So a lot of uh, questions are coming in. Um, the first one is an easy one before we go into some others. What was the most fun part uh, building the city? So what, what, what did you enjoy the most while, while doing it, Nathan? Hmm. <clears throat> That's that's always tricky because there's a lot of things that are uh, kind of fun or rewarding, something like that. Um, for me personally, like uh, there, there's there's two things that I really like. One, seeing it come together, like at kind of towards the end, because we we spent I would say a good year year and a half working on city related things, and so especially some of the the kind of later sequences in production, like the um, the helicopter rescue sequence, those big shots where you're up above New Urbum, to see those come out of lighting, like with all of the animation in there and all the beautiful lighting and all of the hard work and effects and things like that all together, it just kind of, it's one of those things that just kind of knocks your socks off because it's amazing to see so many talented people all all working together to make something really cool. Yeah. Um, on a on a personal level, I'm, I'm also kind of a car guy, so I, um, tried to make a little bit of extra effort um, on this show to get our cars to be um, kind of up to the 
the level of quality of, of everything else to make sure they felt like real cars and didn't feel, um, you know, kind of m more or less cartoony than, than the rest of the world. Cause I really, uh, I really thought they, uh, they turned out pretty well. So it was nice to see, see that stuff all come together. Absolutely. And the success of the movie definitely, uh, shows that you all went into the right direction. Um, we have uh, a shout out from Boris. Thank you for the great presentation. Then we have Ashish here. Nathan, was the city engine data formats also converted into USD? Uh, I don't think so. I think we. Uh, I'd have to go back. And it was, uh, this is one of the tricky things, too, because now it's been almost two or three years since we actually worked on that stuff so <laughs> to pick my I don't think that was USD though I think we used another intermediate format and whether it was um, OBJ or FBX or uh, something similar one of the kind of common interchange formats uh, I'm pretty sure that's how we got most of the stuff across yeah. it's whatever whatever city engine and Houdini both speak that's the language we used that sort of thing <laughs> okay thank you a lot of question here thank you all just keep them uh, Go, coming then we have uh, another one from Freik Hoekstra uh, hopefully I pronounced that one right it's a little bit a longer one so he he first of all shout out very cool talk then how was the building placement handled for the set extension lot subdivision or pre annotation of the primitives that were repeated Hmm. I believe it was lot subdivision. Since I did not do the Houdini work myself, I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that was the case. Yeah. I think it was it was like a, a subdividing uh, thing. Okay. I, I think so. Okay. Um, we're doing two more, I guess, uh, two more questions. Uh, Freak was, was also asking, and that's one also will be there recording available to be at the later date. Yes, we will upload it to the to the box folder, and then we have to make sure that we can finally upload it also uh, onto YouTube. But we need their uh, permission uh, first. So yes, in the box folder you will have the recordings, but then publicly on YouTube uh, we hopefully get the clearing to make that uh, possible. Then, yeah, and and it's it's worth noting too. I don't know, Dominic, if my email, if my contact information is in that box folder. But if there are technical questions that I'm not actually able to answer off the cuff here, then please. Uh, and somebody really needs needs a, a useful answer, then shoot me an email, and I will uh, I will go ask the appropriate uh, person. Because we I think we had a total of about 50 or so people in the sets department uh, over the course of Incredibles too. So there's a lot of people who worked on this stuff. So don't. Um, Don't don't take this as me taking credit for the whole the whole show. I was just the I was kind of the uh, the wrangler that got a lot of uh, talented people together. So uh, I can I can go ask them them questions if people need uh, other other information that I'm not off not able to provide right off the cuff here. Thank you for that. Thank you, um, Dimitri. Uh, we heard you had uh, audio problems and couldn't hear. Is there a possibility to get the recording? Yes, uh, as I just mentioned, just use the. The box folder. Hope you're hearing that. If not, I will I will send you an email with all uh, the details. Then Renata uh, is asking how was 3ds Max use. She, she seems to be a 3ds Max user. <laughs> that that's my fault. I'm I'm a I'm an old school Max guy. Um, <laughs> that's that's what I started. I started with 3ds4 on DOS and used Max. So I use that as an example because I still do my modeling uh, in 3ds Max and then feed it into Maya and it goes into the, the pipeline. And I think that um, uh, Neil Blevins was a modeling and shading artist on the show. And I believe he was a Max user. Um, he, he has since uh, transitioned over into games. But uh, uh, when he was here, I believe that he used 3ds Max on the Underminer vehicle, amongst other things, because he did uh, a lot of the modeling and shading on that. Got it, got it. Then another one is, what was the biggest challenge to create the cities? Hmm. It's, I think, um, this, this, the sheer scope of a city is something that is not to be kind of taken lightly when, when if you decide I need to, to build a city, to try to make a, 
a believable large scale city that you can both walk on the streets of and fly over like those those things um it just it's just an enormous amount of work to make all the models and to um you know figure out a system to put them all together in a believable manner we don't have to do it by hand like that um that just took it takes a lot of people a lot of time to to kind of just brute force make a lot of assets before you end up getting to even getting to the point where you can run your procedural systems to distribute those things um so you know in in the case of incredibles 2 we were i think originally um supposed to be a, a longer production schedule but our our release date was moved up a bit so we essentially lost about a year of of production and development time early on so we we kind of ended up making the whole um the whole film in about a year and a half of of actual production time so having to make all that stuff and make a city that was going that's going to look you know, good enough to uh, to be up on the screen in front of millions of people. Um, it's really just kind of a, it's a daunting task. It's a it's a lot. Of, it's just a lot of work. You know, it's a, a sheer scale sort of thing. Absolutely, Renata wanted to say thank you, thank you for the amazing webinar. I'm a 3ds Max user too, and it's good to know that it's useful with City Engine. Thank you for that. Then um, Freik was asking about what's the email address. Is it is it okay if I put it in the box folder? Yeah, yeah, we can. We'll, we'll put one in there. Okay, I, I will put it up there so you can you can uh, uh, get it there. Um, uh, Luke is answering, and I think that that's the last one. Uh, that we can take here on the webinar. Uh, nice presentation. If you can remember what number of lights did you get up to? Can you remember? That <laughs> no, one? I have no, I have no idea to tell you the truth. I think I know it's in the thousands, uh -huh. um, but that's one that um, since the lighting department is uh, uh, was was not my responsibility. Uh, uh, I could I could probably find out, but I know it was at least in the thousands, especially in those great big. Big uh, like yeah. overhead city shots, if if not tens of thousands, it's it's tons. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Okay, uh, we are within those forty five minutes, and I think that's all for now. If we could not answer your question during the webinar, we will come back to you directly via email or the phone. And let me now conclude the webinar and remind everybody that we set up that box folder with all the content and links from today's webinar, and we are also. Uh, we will add uh, Nathan's email address up there and you can access this box folder at bit.ly slash VES webinar 2019. And if you are going to SIGGRAPH next week and if you want to meet us, please use the link bit.ly slash SIGGRAPH 2019. And finally, let me say one more time, Thanks to you, Nathan, for an amazing presentation, as well as thanks to everybody at VS and Pixar to make this uh, webinar happen. We hope yeah, to see you all next week at Seacraft in, in beautiful LA. And yeah, thank, from, thanks, to, uh, thanks to everyone for, uh, for coming, spending some time with us to, uh, to listen to me ramble on about cities for a while. I appreciate it because it's, uh, it's a thing that, uh, that I enjoy and hope, uh, hope you all had a, had a decent time too. Thank you so much, Nathan. Goodbye and auf Wiedersehen.